Um, and wow, Katie Donahue, great question. Will this be recorded and shared afterward? Absolutely. We are going to be recording uh, this virtual roundtable today. Uh, we'll be posting this on our Akua YouTube channel. And I'm sure that Teresa and uh, Teresa and Joel will be putting this together as a follow-up email to the group as well. Um, by registering for the session today, we will be able to follow up with you via the email address you gave us on that. Um, this is an interactive session, as you can see by our lovely array of webcams that are active and microphones that you hopefully have access to on your end. Um, yeah, so to get us started, I'll get us kicked off and we will, uh, we will continue to have this be as free flowing as possible. Um, welcome to today's virtual roundtable that is really hosted by our Housing Facility Services Committee. Uh, my name is Spencer Giese. I'm a research and education specialist at AKUI, and um, I've had the true pleasure the past month or so of leading a number of virtual roundtables um, for our field and a variety of disciplines and topics. Um, and today is really our first jump into moving from the a few people on webcam and some talking to really the opportunity to open it up and hear from the group and allow a lot of connection and sharing. Um, so thank you for uh, being one of our very first groups to take on this, this approach. Um, and definitely thank you to Teresa and Joel for really being trailblazers on this and helping us um, take this approach and run with it. Um, I know that this, this housing facility services group has had monthly meetings for as long as I can remember in a KUI and have been used to be phone calls, conference calls, and then some go-to meeting conference calls where you might see a face here and there and see some PowerPoint decks. And we moved to the land of Zoom where now you're seeing a lot more interaction. Um, and we're now able to really open it up to uh, the larger the larger community of a KUI and make sure that we're creating a space for people in this area to connect and hear what's going on on other campuses. Um, so before we get started, I just always love to point out a number of Akuai resources that are out there. So we have a number of uh, YouTube recordings based on our past virtual roundtables. Um, you can find threads in our Akuai online community that are dedicated to COVID-19 response on campuses uh, and really drilling down to specific topics there that may be of interest to you. And then we've also got a, we also have a dedicated COVID-19 resources page on our Akuai website. Um, and before I throw it over to Teresa and Joel to introduce themselves and talk about our session, a couple items I'll say when we're working with Zoom. Um, as you've seen, I know as Mike, Timothy, and Katie have taken advantage of and Mark, uh, we have a chat. So if you uh, look at your Zoom menu, maybe it's under the More tab. Um, we do have the ability to chat with everyone in the group. Um, you should be able to drag down and chat with someone individually, chat with everyone in the group. Great way to connect with one another. Um, I thank you if you are able to use a webcam and you are, thank you so much for having your webcam on. Uh, in these days of work from home during a global pandemic, it can be a bit isolating for ourselves. So it's nice to be able to connect with folks all over that we might have seen, you know, in a meeting typically or a campus uh, or even a camp, even a conference. So we're glad to be able to connect with you in that way. Um, and really this is, this is going to be a session that what you what you are active and you're engaging, you're able to make this great session. But I don't want to take up too much time. Um, if you have, uh, you should be able to see in your viewing options uh, for webcams, there is like a nine square tile. That's, if you click on that option, you'll be able to see many, many uh, of the participants all at once. So I advise that. Uh, just depends on how many screens you have to work with at home. So enough logistics. Let's get down to business. Let's connect. I'll throw it over to Teresa. Teresa, if you could just introduce yourself, talk a little bit about this group, what your role is, um, and just say hello. All right. Thank you, Spencer. I am so glad to see everyone with us here today. There's a lot of familiar faces, um, but also some new ones, so I'm glad that we can connect. Uh, today might be different than some roundtable um, discussions that you've participated in because this is also serving as our Housing Facility Services Committee meeting. 
So in addition to having a time for us to share in general, we will also provide some highlights about the work of the Housing Facility Services Committee. Um, we, this committee, uh, our, our goal is to serve membership of a KUHO I who has responsible and ha responsibilities in housing facilities and services. Some of our work is related to providing um, the quality conference that Jason and his team provides for us um, in October. Um, but we also provide a communication link for the membership, ways for folks to engage who have responsibilities within the facilities area. Um, so we'll talk a little bit more with our subcommittees about some of the things that fall into that um, and ways for you to join us and connect in that work. I'll turn it over to Joel to introduce himself. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, my name is Joel Gaddy. I'm here at Oklahoma State University. Um, I'm in our operations manager role. Uh, I've been in this role for about a year, uh, a little over a year now. Uh, however, I've been at OSU for uh, since 2014. So um, really, um, this committee was one that um, if you're active in the uh, KUI Open Forum, that's kind of how I got connected to this um, and just asked the question of how I could help out or be connected and, and Teresa was very quickly happy to help and, and get us going. So some of y'all may have seen an email from a random guy at Oklahoma State last week uh, about this meeting, but we're super thankful uh, that y'all were able to join us today. Um, and if they're not on a listserv or want to be on a listserv, uh, please don't ever hesitate to reach out. We're more than happy to make sure that you're getting uh, the information and communications that we're sending out as a committee. Great. Thanks, Teresa, and thanks, Joel. Um, a little bit more about our structure as we move forward. Really, we want this to be a conversation. So um, as we go forth, uh, there will be some questions that are brought up to the group. Um, that's an opportunity for, you know, we have some airspace for folks to unmute, um, chat, or you can use the chat function if you'd like to add a point. Um, totally up to you. Um, as you. As you talk in this session, if you could just introduce yourself, position, uh, who you are, where you're at, things like that. And as always, we encourage you to use that chat function to stay connected via, via text and typing capabilities. Um, I know Teresa had brought up that we're gonna hear from some members of the committee and what they've been working on as we move forward. So I'll throw it back to Teresa to bring up our next speaker. Great, uh, we have Jason Frazier Nash to tell us more about the conference committee and some updates for their team. Yeah, good afternoon, everybody. My name is Jason. I'm the Assistant Director for Graduate and Family Housing at the University of Florida. I've been here since 2011. Uh, we met last week and uh, I spoke with both of the associations, uh, Akuhoi and APA, about the facilities conference. And at this time, we are still a go. We are still looking for uh, presentations. We'll be reaching out to folks if you're interested in doing a uh, proposal for that. That uh, deadline is coming up in about a month. Uh, JJ is working on getting us a, a keynote speaker and Aubrey and uh, Allison are working on putting together a fantastic educational program. Uh, I know as we move forward, the associations will definitely be looking uh, to New Orleans, uh, the state of Louisiana and the hotel to uh, ensure that we're safe and secure. Um, and if there's any updates, we will let everybody know as soon as possible. Jason, could you go ahead and share the dates for fall conference? Uh, yeah, hold on. I'm using my phone today. Oh. My, my, my <laughs> internet <laughs> is uh, giving me hassle all day long. I will get back to you in a second. That's great, thank you. Any questions for Jason besides the, the date? If you would just put those in the chat and we will circle back to him. And that conference is going to be October 12th to the 15th, October 12th to the 15th in New Orleans. All right. That's correct. Thank you. Great. Seeing no further questions for the conference committee, we'll move on to our Education and Resources Committee. Steve? Yeah, hello, everyone. <clears throat> Yeah, this is a this is a great idea, actually. Um, you know, to see everybody and a tremendous amount of participants in this. So, as far as the Education and Resources Committee goes, um, I, I don't have a lot of real updates. Everybody's been kind of 
um, swamped with what's going on. But as, as I was driving in this morning, I thought um, this whole new normal um, is going to provide a lot of opportunity for the Education and Resource Committee um, to, to put together, um, reach out and work with any institution that wants to get involved um, in developing uh, a series of best practices um, in regards to responses around a situation like this going forward. Um, I had that conversation with uh, my vice president this morning um, type of thing. So uh, there's a lot of work that'll need to be done going forward on this committee. Um, and then uh, we're also, um, Spencer, I don't know if we've able to update the um, a cool website yet with the uh, fee waiver program information so we can get um, also continue to move forward with that. Um, I'll just ask that question and uh, take any questions from there. Thank you, Steve. Uh, we will have the APA Institute fee waiver live soon on the Akuo I website. So we'll make sure that there's some additional publicity about that for folks that are interested. The That's APA Institute, uh, we provide that waiver, uh, Akuo I and APA as a, a partnership. So for folks who want to attend that institute, it's a fantastic learning opportunity. The next session uh, will be in the fall, typically in September. So we'll make sure more information is out for that when the, the application is live. And we've got we've got two fee waivers for the September conference, correct, Teresa? That is correct, Steve. Yep. So two two folks will get to participate in that opportunity. So that's very exciting. And that's in Pittsburgh. All right, we'll go ahead and move to education and re uh, no sorry, the committee for the recruitment of minorities and women in housing facilities. Good afternoon, everybody. This is Didi Knickerberg. I'm the Director of Housing and Residence Life at the University of Idaho, um, and I am happy to serve in this role for the association and, and this committee. I, like Steve, um, don't have a ton of updates, but some things I could share with the broader audience. Um, would be that um, our committee has been responsible for uh, managing and creating um, a roundtable at the annual conference in October, where we bring together folks and we've traditionally done a roundtable format and we generally um, have an opportunity to connect with one another and then we generally have created vignettes that have been springboards for conversations amongst the group that participate in our roundtable session um, about, you know, scenarios and experiences that some of us in the housing facility area um, have encountered over time. In addition, um, the group that is currently um, working with me this year uh, expressed an interest in doing uh, a mentor-mentee program um, with our committee um, and, and reaching out more broadly. And what I did too was I reached out to the Women in Housing Network folks. Uh, there's a couple of chairs that are leading that in hopes that we could collaborate um, with what they're doing in the Women in Housing Network and those of us who want to have a mentor mentee program within the facilities area. Um, and then all things um, virus happened um, and we haven't got back to that, but it is my goal as we move forward uh, to get reconnected on that topic. And so if you're interested at all in that, either um, having a mentor or being, or being a mentor, excuse me, or having a mentee, uh, feel free to reach out and we would always welcome more participation in our uh, subcommittee of the Akuai Facilities Group. And so if you are interested, feel free to email me. Um, we'd love to have you uh, as part of our group. Great, thank you, Dee Dee. Um, I'll go ahead and I'm going to speak for the Sustainable Facilities Committee. Uh, we had a meeting last Monday um, and really folks are kind of regrouping um, in light of what everybody's working through, but we are real close to being able to release the next sustainability scene newsletter. Um, and so if you have anything of interest that we could put together an article on, we would welcome um, some information on that. Additionally, we do have some upcoming leadership opportunities within that group. So if that is something that you would be interested in, please let me know and um, we can work through that possibility for you. I'll turn it over to Joel for our communication committee. 
helps to remember to click on mute. Don't forget to do that, y'all. Um, as far as uh, the communication committee, uh, we are, um, obviously there's a lot uh, that will randomly pop up here and there on the Akuhoi board that could be um, on the open form that could be relatable to facilities. Um, so we're trying to figure out best way practice uh, to figure out how we can kind of keep that all together, um, keep specifically folks uh, like those and all of us that are a part of this meeting today kind of connected to what's happening there. Um, I know that that's, uh, you know, there's a lot of emails, a lot of messages that show up on that board. Um, and so sometimes I think we, uh, as the committee, have talked about potentially being able to bring some of that into this meeting um, to be like, hey, this had come up on the open forum. Let's, let's unpack that a little bit more. Um, we are also in the process of um, figuring out how to engage other um, of the smaller regional conferences um, to let them know about this opportunity in this group. Um, so re working through the Swakuhos and the, um, the uh, oh yeah, all the other alphabet soup out there of different regional conferences of uh, or groups that are a subcommittee of Akua to make sure that they're uh, aware that this that this exists. Um, there is, you'll see a link uh, kind of on the, on the page right now. Uh, we will be sending that link out after in a recap. Um, it does have uh, um, a, an area where you can fill out kind of interest um, if there's something that specifically you want to be uh, further more connected in. Um, and we're going to be using that to be able to try to uh, message better to this entire group and keep kind of running the loop. So that's where we're at right now. Again, though, if there's other folks in your uh, department or in your institution that you think would benefit from being a part of this group or this information, we'd be more than happy to add them to our listserv. Um, and yeah, let us know how we can help. Thank you, Joel. So we are now at the point in the meeting where we typically would open things up to our consult with colleague time. And this is a time where we either have a discussion topic or folks bring whatever questions they might have. And so our discussion topic today is really what Spencer started the meeting with and what went out in all of the communications is what are folks um, working through on their campuses in response to COVID-19 to support their staff and continue operations. And so uh, we wanted to start with a couple of general questions today and we've asked a couple of our experts um, or our experienced staff members to share what are some things that they're doing on their campuses, what have, what's been important. Um, there are tons of things that we could all list, um, but wanted to have some folks share some things from their perspective. Um, to spark our conversation and then also what are some of the priorities moving forward. Um, speaking for my for myself and our campus, our priorities, there's some some threads that seem to continue week to week. Um, but as the situation evolves, there's different things that are coming up each week. So really asking our folks to kind of share where we're at right now as we look ahead. And so um, the first person I want to turn it over to um, is Daniel Sheets. Daniel agreed to share a couple thoughts with us today. Uh, Daniel is the Associate Director for Facility Services at Florida State, and I hope he's been able to jump on. I have not. Yes, I'm here. Sir. Great. Thank you, Daniel. Um, so I asked Daniel just to share some of some thoughts on these two questions. Daniel? Sure. Uh, thanks, Lucy, again. Um, so uh, just for a quick little bit of context, uh, our housing facilities unit is internal um, to our housing department. So we're a unified system. Um, uh, and so as I kind of speak about this, um, you know, I know that everybody has a little bit different setup and scenario where you are. So this can look a little bit different. Um, you know, the first things that kind of come out is, you know, that come to mind, um, that I'll spend a, just a, a quick moment touching on, but I want to get to some other pieces, are, you know, making sure that you're working with whoever your suppliers are, whether you have a, uh, an in-house supply operation or you use central facilities or someone else, but um, how hard is it, you know, obviously making sure that you're trying to keep your PPE uh, up, up to speed, uh, looking at those jobs that your facility staff does that requires um, PPE, like for instance, masks, those are one of those things where we had to have some conversations to say we can, we are right now are only able to provide masks for work related um, tasks that require them as part of PPE. Um, you know, we've gotten with our environmental health and safety organization here on campus to uh, give to give those 
resources and house staff that they would like to on a voluntary basis. They're more than welcome to make and bring their own. Um, just things like that, more day-to-day -day operations, making sure we understand where the disinfecting, you know, how often do we need to do it? How do we need to do it? Uh, working with uh, checking in, or I'm sorry, not checking in, but moving out. And so staying close to your residence life staff to really try to make sure that you're integrated with that so you know when to do it, where to do it, and all the different types of support uh, you need. A couple of other pieces I was going to mention were um, really as a facilities leader in, in your unit organization, you really want to make sure that you are being aware and looking out for those advocacy moments. Um, and so we're, uh, you know, right now we're in a all in chartered waters. Um, and so you need to be as up to speed as possible with HR matters. Um, how are things going on financially for your department or your university? And where can you really advocate for your staff? Um, uh, and, and so that kind of rolls into the next thing of our, at least at FSU, our main priority has been we want to try to do everything we possibly can to keep our staff working. That was the main priority for us to make sure that everybody can take home a paycheck um, for as long as we possibly can. Um, and so trying to work again, going back to being connected to HR, what, what leave options are available for them? Um, when can we take advantage of that? Or, and, you know, uh, also trying to make sure that um, you're, you're trying to keep everyone up to date on essential versus non-essential. Um, what are those jobs that uh, now is the time to do? If, if, if they either don't cost a lot of money or your department hasn't just com been completely gutted financially, what are those tasks that you can maybe do in-house with your staff that can really uh, help advocate for why your staff A, need to be on campus, and then B, uh, uh, they can really help propel you forward. So real quickly, one of the examples we've had is that we have a building that, you know, obviously has some, um, has some controlling the humidity is tougher in that building than in other places. Well, we've always talked about being able to go in and to maybe take uh, another uh, three quarters or an inch off the bottom of those doors as long as it's not breaking any fire code to get more air return underneath the doors. Right, and so we're able to do that. We were going to be contracting that out, and it costs us anywhere from fifteen to twenty thousand dollars to do that. We're able to do that in house now, so it's something that we can show we're bringing value uh, to to the work that we're doing and to the, the health of that building. We're keeping our own internal staff working now that uh, we have the actual the manpower and the time to do that. So those are a couple of different things that I would look for. Is again, as as a, as a leader, be in touch with what's going on in the leadership of your university. Because the other thing I would say is in this time of uncertainty where everyone's just trying to figure things out, they may not always be looking out for what's best for you and your staff. And so you're the one that's got to connect the dots for your staff. Because if you don't, you may miss, um, you may miss something um, that you had an opportunity for. Um, so really look at that. Uh, again, uh, do everything you can to take advantage of when the buildings may not be as empty or may not be as full as they usually are at this time. Uh, some of you may have completely empty buildings. We don't. We still have stuff into the buildings and we're talking about having uh, halls may not be empty until the end of June, early July, based upon the processes that our local town gown relationship um, and the, uh, our, our board of trustees are comfortable with. But what can we continue to do? Because at the end of the day for us, it's keeping um, a paycheck in our staff's hands. And so those are the couple of things I've mentioned and I'll turn it back over to you, Teresa. Thank you, Daniel. I, I appreciate those thoughts. Um, I, I really appreciate your um, comments on connecting the dots for folks who perhaps are not as attuned to your operations and really that focus on people because it's real easy in, in these moments to, to lose sight of that. And I appreciate that. Um, looking at the chat, some folks have been talking about um, PPE. You kind of sparked some dialogue there, um, Daniel. And it looks like some folks have had um, okay luck um, in getting PPE, but some folks have had some difficulty in acquiring disinfectant wipes and hand sanitizer. So I would just want to draw attention to that. If you are having success in that area, if you wouldn't mind jumping on the chat um, and sharing 
your experience there or recommend some suppliers. Um, let's see. Uh, I would now like, are there any questions for Daniel? I guess I should say. One other conversation I would like to put out there in the chat based on Daniel's comments are, um, are there others who are doing some projects on your campus now that perhaps you have some space um, or time because we don't have as much reactive maintenance because we don't have as many people in our space. So perhaps that's allowing us some different time. So could folks maybe share um, in the chat, what are some of those projects that you're doing to add value because you don't have to out, you don't have to outsource that now. Um, let's go ahead and, and start that conversation there. Um, while we have that going on, I would like to um, open the floor to Dee Dee Knickenberg from the University of Iowa, uh, Idaho, my goodness, Idaho, sorry, Dee Dee. Um, and Dee Dee, would you kind of share some of your thoughts on the questions today? You bet. I'm going to kind of uh, echo Daniel's comments about the advocacy for your staff, um, something that I know that was really important for us because as, as um, most of what's happening in my department is most of us are working remotely with the exception of our trades maintenance and custodial team. Um, and so what was really important um, is making sure that they still um, felt um, you know, important and that we cared about them. And so we tried to do some things in terms of, um, you know, buying lunch a couple of days um, when this thing initially um, started to roll out for us in Idaho, um, really making sure that they knew that we cared about them, we valued them. I know it could, it probably felt very isolating for them. Um, I think institutionally, you know, they had some strong feelings about how they felt our institution was doing. Um, and in terms of the care um, component for them. That's why I wanted to make sure that as a department, we were doing things to recognize them and to show them that while many of us are not there while they are working, um, that we still cared and that, you know, um, they were really important and that we couldn't do what we we're doing um, without them showing up every day. So I wanted to make sure that they didn't feel forgotten. Um, and so we tried to do some recognition things, did a little snack bags for them, you know, nothing too terribly fantastic or fancy, um, but again, kind of pulling back from those res life roots to do some, to do some recognition for those teams that were having to come every day um, and show up. And so that was something that all of us on our management team felt very strongly that we needed to make sure that they knew how important they were to us um, as they are always, but of course, under these extreme circumstances that um, they were even more so that way because they were um, considered essential and had to, to start showing up to campus. Um, some of the other things in terms of priorities that that we've been focusing on, um, and as probably most of you can realize, um, those priorities shift at any given moment. Um, for us, we really work uh, currently on um, our modeling and our occupancy for fall. And so we're sort of looking a few months ahead, trying to determine um, what will our occupancy look like in terms of the number of bed spaces that we're going to be able to have um, and advertise to students. Um, you know, we're in an interesting situation. I mentioned this Teresa to, to Teresa that I think has been an interesting experience for us on top of a pandemic um, at our institution. We've been trying to figure out um, how to centralize while this is all going on um, amidst actually even some outsourcing conversation. So the outsourcing has been um, put to bed and we're not going to be doing that as an institution, but we are still going to be centralizing up under our uh, central plant. Um, and so now that uh, that decision has been made, that's certainly a priority for us in the next couple of months um, on top of all the other um, scenario planning and, and that we're doing in terms of um, what campus might look like for us in the fall. So that's been interesting. Um, and then Teresa talked about project work. We're finding obviously that we're getting into spaces that we normally couldn't get into until late May, early June, because we're a semester school. Um, so we have been taking advantage of that. Um, it's a two-pronged approach in terms of uh, turning the rooms right now that we have uh, access to, um, as well as getting in and doing some of the projects that we would normally have waited till June or July.
July. Um, so that is, um, I guess, a silver lining, as they would say, in this whole experience. Um, but again, really for us, it's trying to understand um, also something unique to my campus is understanding whether or not we'll have to house more students under a reduced occupancy um, and what our institutional priorities will be. We're in an interesting situation in that we have Greek life and students who are first years can live in Greek housing. And so we are trying to balance uh, conversations about if we were to take on the Greek students that would normally be in sleeping porches in their chapter houses, um, but if that's deemed to be an unsafe type of situation, would we be taking those students on and under a reduced occupancy um, plan, would we then have to go and communicate to our returning students who've already committed to us through our room sign up process um, that we could no longer house them because first year students are a priority. So um, no decisions have been made on that, but that is a conversation that we've started um, discussing at our campus and, and what will that look like. Great. Thank, thank you, Dee Dee. Um, really appreciate, I really appreciate some of those specific ideas on how you took care of staff. Um, that's definitely something that um, was a challenge for us on our campus as we transitioned some folks to remote work, um, but some staff are, are what we um, deem critical, which means you can't work from home. There's no opportunity for your, any portion of your work to be remote. Um, and so there, there's a lot of feelings that come with that, um, that perhaps I'm being left in a risky situation while you can go home and be in your safe place. So I think that was really great how you had some specific ways that you continued to show value for your staff. Um, on that note, are there others who have things that you have done um, to help folks while while in transition, the folks that are frontline staff, what are some thoughts on how you've taken care of your frontline staff? Um, I see Kyle Estes is on the call. Hi, Kyle. Um, Kyle, would you be willing to not necessarily share on that topic, but just share a couple things um, in general um, in your experience and, and lay down some wisdom? <laughs> I don't have any of that, sorry. Um, sure, you know, a lot of the same things that Daniel and Didi have said uh, ring true here as well at Texas State. Um, <clears throat> once we got our, you know, 6,800 students gone um, and just were down with our handful of people who had no better place to go, um, how do you work around them carefully, those sorts of things. And so we also started our summer term, we started some summer projects those sorts of things. Um, I think lessons learned, um, you know, really communication has been critical. Um, as this first got kicked off here, um, having just a department-wide meeting um, that from the, you know, everybody attended and we just kind of walked them through, this is what's going on, this is where our priorities are, here's how we're handling this, here's where you need to go for answers. Um, there was a lot of training about communication and looking at facts and not listening to social media or, you know, newscasts, you know, uh, make sure you go to our web page from the university um, because that's where the facts that impact you as an employee are going to be found. Um, and even for supervisors, this is where you need to go to get your answers to answer those for your employees. Have you checked the FAQ page? That's all information that's there, whether it's HR information about leave balances and what to use or not to use, um, or just kind of when the, what's the latest updates for our region, those sorts of things. So communication has been key. Um, also helping our staff to understand and remember they're trained for this is from a safety perspective. Many of them have been, you know, they've all been through the bloodborne pathogens training and appropriate use of PPE and those sorts of things. And so some of them are the better trained people on our staff to be able to keep themselves safe while they're still providing critical services for others. And so um, encouraging them in that, reminding them of that, um, that they can, can do their jobs effectively um, while they're still providing services in this kind of uncertain time. I think that, um, 
you know, making sure that supervisors know in the first the beginning of the day, check on your staff, ask questions, ask them politely, but has anything changed for you about your own health, about someone in your family? Do you need to take time off because of care of others? What's going on with that? Um, not to pry, not to invade people's privacy, but to make sure that they know that we're concerned about them and wanting to take care of them as they take care of others. Um, and so those kind of habits have been good to be developed. Um, also worked, uh, uh, as some people have said, you know, how to make sure people understand that they're not going to lose their jobs. We've been, you know, very strong about that here. We haven't had any of those problems, um, but also looking into some of our peers. Uh, I've had conversations with our campus rec uh, and our student center facility staff. Um, their facilities are 100% shut down practically. Um, so now what do they do with their staff? And I said, you know, if you run out of projects and you need things, let me know. Maybe we can kind of work something out because we do have to turn for the summer. Um, and we're not going to be able to use some of our outside vendor sources that we in some cases have been able to use. So having some additional staff might be helpful. So let me help you before you start talking about furloughing someone, that sort of thing. Um, luckily, that's not had to happen. Um, but just letting them know that we can work together as a team of student affairs colleagues to help take care of one another, if at all possible. Um, I think those are really the highlights other than, you know, just as everybody I'm sure has already learned, flexibility is critical. Um, relationships are critical. I've um, been very blessed to have a great chief medical officer on our campus that I work very closely with and, um, you know, managing any issues that have come up. Although I have to admit that he's been added to my list of people I don't enjoy seeing calling my cell phone. Uh, used to be just the university chief of police, and the director of the counseling center, and the utility ops director, but now uh, the chief medical officer has been added to that list of people I don't enjoy answering the phone from. <laughs> great. Th thank you, Kyle. Um, I think one of the great um, pieces that you shared that kind of opens up another opportunity is working across lines, whether that's division or department lines. Um, so would love for folks to maybe either jump on the chat and talk about that or if someone um, wants to share now and if you want to like type in the chat, hey, I, I would really like to speak about that. Um, at Missouri State, out of the gate, that is something that was put on the table for us. Um, our academic custodial um, for the past three weeks have, has gone into housing to support their custodial team in turning buildings. Um, it's not because our academic area is without work. They are just reprioritizing to help housing um, be ready should there be a need um, for one of our facilities to be used for healthcare. Um, or just um, to be ready for camps and conference operation without needing to outsource to um, local vendors like they typically would. Um, so we went into that about three weeks ago. Um, that's been going pretty well. We have not sent our entire staff over, but we've sent a designated number of staff members. Um, and the, the reason we made the choice to do it in that way is so that we could continue our operations and managing our areas of responsibility, but then allow that group of folks to learn the housing process and how to turn rooms because it's very different than maintaining classrooms um, and offices. And so that we've been doing that for about three weeks now um, and anticipate that's going to continue for the next um, month to six weeks at least. So are there others that want to comment on working across lines or other areas in which you've worked across lines? I'm going to look at the chat here to see what folks are doing. Okay, so in regards to some of the projects that folks are sharing that they're doing um, to add value, um, folks are talking about doing light, lighting retrofits to LED, um, plumbing fixture changes, um, lots of painting projects are being done on multiple campuses. So if that's something you haven't looked at, um, some great opportunities. I love that lighting retrofit project. That's great. Um, let's see, we've got a question here. Um, so I guess this is specific to Jacob Horton. Jacob, if you'd make sure you're on the chat to answer, there's a question for you about coding your billing. So if you could jump on there, um, that would be great. Um, let's see, some HVAC work. 
All right. Um, I want to make sure, um, Leonard Jones, are you, do I still see your face? I'm here, Teresa. I was trying to be incognito. <laughs> Leonard, I would love to hear some of your um, thoughts or different things that you guys are doing or prioritizing, if you wouldn't mind. Uh, not at all. Um, one of the things that I think Western Washington has been very successful at doing is right at the start of um, its entire process, we instituted the ICS command structure, the incident command structure that is used by FEMA for uh, crisis and disasters and the like. They're usually uh, suited for wildfires or tornadoes or other devastating uh, occurrences in communities, but uh, our institution instituted that. I'm a part of that structure along with many others across divisions and, and departments. And early on, under an ICS structure, uh, my vice president and direct uh, supervisor um, is the university's uh, incident command uh, person. So she's making decisions with the help of this cross divisional team uh, connected to classes, connected to uh, the student life, connected to finances of the institution. So it, it takes a very different, uh, for those of you that are, are so structured, it takes a very different mindset from the traditional, I report this way, I report in this structure, I report in, in, in this division of uh, this way to a, a new way of interacting with colleagues and others. But it's really helped us, uh, I think, here at, at Western Washington. So just, just how we're structured uh, or restructured to just handle all the questions, um, as all of us on this call know, it's far beyond any one department. <laughs> on any campus. Um, so I, I think that's really helped us tremendously. And then I, I would quickly add a couple of other things uh, just early on, making sure we had the right uh, messaging. Uh, we started with, we're going to take our guidance from the county health uh, professionals. Uh, we said that early on, so we didn't get into Lysol comments and all the other kind of nonsense that people are hearing on, on television, um, but really just stayed focused on uh, whatever uh, the doctors at the county health department say. Um, we've, uh, I, I tell you something else that's a little bit unexpected for us, and again, under the structure, I mentioned we stepped through as well. That is um, food insecurity and uh, housing insecurity playing more of a role uh, than we typically would um, with those particular issues. And then lastly, some of you know, Washington State is a very uh, unionized environment and COVID-19 has done nothing to change that. So that's another key element on in unionized environments is the work with those union presidents and shop stewards uh, outside of the traditional structures um, in, in terms of additional work and those sorts of things. It does work, uh, but as you can imagine, in, in such times when people are very concerned about their positions, the last thing <laughs> I would say on our campus, the union needs to hear is for a well-meaning RD taking someone else's job that's unionized. That is not something you wish to negotiate at this particular point in time. I, I think it's likely, Dr. Jones, that we could probably have a whole session on the impact on unions and things that we need to be mindful of. And it, it really kind of depends on 
our state and our campus on how, what the implications are. Um, so that's a really good point for folks to keep in mind because, you know, we've done a lot of um, flexibility has been important. We've got to be flexible and we've got to be creative and we're going to do what we can to add value, but we do have to keep that in mind. Absolutely. Um, it looks like some folks are sharing some things that, um, that they're doing. They're using this time um, to work on their um, standard operating procedures for their staff and updating some manuals. So that's a great use of this time because um, a lot of times we just don't have time for planning. So that's a great use of things there. Um, uh, there's some great information here on how folks are handling procurement in the chat. So I would encourage folks to look at what Dominic has shared and also some great thoughts from, um, from Kyle on that. So um, one thing Kyle share, shared is that vendors are prioritizing big orders. Um, so if we can work with campus partners to get a bigger order, that will um, serve us well as we look at that. Um, I saw, now Jessica Abbott, I see you there. Jessica, you work with a lot, do you work with a lot of student staff? Oh. Yep, sorry, I had to find the unmute button here. It's different for each different platform. Um, uh, yes, I do work with student staff. Great, and I do you, you run the, the facilities after our team, is that right? Yep. Great, so I wonder, Jessica, and we had not talked about this in advance, but would you mind touching on what kind of implications you've had on that program or kind of how you've, how you've shifted? Because I think you have a fantastic program there. And, and one of the things I, I did want to talk about today is where you're really heavy on your student employees and student labor to make things work. What, what are we doing now? Yeah, so that has been a real struggle for us because um, our university president says that he doesn't want any student employees on campus right now. So we had to send them all home and it's kind of been hard to rethink our process now that we've been relying on these student employees for um, probably close to 15 years now. Um, so we're used to having them be the frontline responders after hours. So thankfully, because we don't have a lot of people on campus still, there hasn't been a lot of calls that we needed to respond to. We only have about 40 students that are here still and um, a handful of first responders that are housed in one of our apartment buildings. Um, so we had to adapt to some of our full-time staff and asking them to be on call to triage and make the call-ins and just kind of had to explain like all right if we can't have these students then it's going to be the four hour callback pay to a tradesperson for something that might be simple that's an adjustment thank you jessica that no there's problem. some budget implications there as well then right so they want to save on like the student so because the students are home they don't have to pay the full room and board portion of their um, financial aid their package that it's compensation on their financial aid so they're trying to save that money there and not having anyone here working hourly. And we've been lucky so far not needing to call anyone in to see like, all right, look, these four hour increments will add up. So while there aren't many people on campus, we're making it work, but we're just nervous for if we'll be able to re-implement the program as we're used to. Mm -hmm. And th this is hiring season. And so we're all trying to figure out how do we hire and how many positions do we hire for? Um, so that's a piece as well. Um, let's see, are there, so let's see if there's some, some questions to the group here. There's lots of great um, sharing that folks are doing um, in the chat. Let's see. Um, Katie Donahue has asked a question to the group. I'm curious if COVID-19 is changing design requirements for things like student housing or other campus buildings either updating existing spaces or for the planning of future spaces to aid in health and wellness. So does anyone have some thoughts that you'd like to share on that? Whether it's official design changes or how you're approaching how you're gonna assign.
John, I know that that's not necessarily your thing, but is there anything that John Tingley that perhaps you'd want to share or comment on? Yeah, so I put it in the comments. We're in design on a new complex, and the current pandemic has not inform has not changed our plan in any way. Um, I think we think we're building healthy buildings anyway, so we've not um, we've talked about it, but we're not changing anything. Thank you, John. Is there anybody else who's in a design process right now um, who's had the conversations? Teresa uh, Leonard again from Western Washington. We're just like John. We're, we, we've got a $67 million building uh, that's just a hole in the ground right now. <laughs> but, uh, you know, we will soon have a building. We're thinking we're designing uh, healthy in, in that sense. But one thing that we are seeing is that, and we've made this commitment, we are assigning students from a social distance perspective at least for spring quarter now. We are assigning students to housing. Um, every student get their own room and no more than two people sharing a bathroom. Uh, so for some social distancing kind of requirements, uh, we've made that commitment. Um, and I, I think a little bit of hiccups, but for the most part, it's worked for us uh, to make sure that we continue even in this uh, time to honor the uh, disability uh, access uh, accommodations that you know students have had and uh, we've co uh, consolidated buildings uh, and students from you know three people on the floor that's designed for 50 relocate them to other parts of the campus so we can kind of mothball some of our our larger buildings thank you leonard i appreciate that um, before we, um, I want to be mindful of our time, but um, if Dr. Bridgeforth is in the call, on the call, um, he is our Akuho I Executive Board Liaison, so if he is still on the call, I wanted to open the opportunity up for him to make any comments. Um, okay, so as we go ahead and wrap things up, I just wanted to make a couple of summary statements from the different things that I've heard today. Um, in this discussion portion of the conversation. Um, it's really important, um, based on what folks have shared, is to have some um, good relationships with vendors so that you can make sure that you have adequate supplies of PPE and, and things of that nature for your staff. Um, our staff have been probably trained and, are, and more prepared than most for the situation. So I think that's a great piece for us as Kyle shared to remind our staff that we've, we've been trained for this and, and we're probably more ready than others. Um, uh, like the comments from, again from Daniel on how can we bring value in this time? And so it could be that we're doing um, those lighting um, retrofits that folks have talked about or we're painting or perhaps it's that we're showing flexibility. So and whatever it is that each of our teams um, is responsible for, how do we add value to the university, even in this time that is a little uncertain and just a little bit different than normal? Communication is critical. Multiple folks have commented on how important that is um, and how important it is to start early with the correct messaging and making sure we're getting folks to a centralized communication point if that's possible to make sure if that's where all the HR updates go or um, the employee policies that are changing that we know where to send folks and we're, we're up front with our messaging. Um, incident command structure is very important and I hope um, that your campuses participate in that pro participate and approach your emergencies in that way similar to what Dr. Jones has shared. If that is not something you're familiar with, um, we can definitely um, get you connected in some of that so you can reach out to Dr. Jones or myself and we can kind of share what that looks like on our campuses um, as a resource, but it really um, impacts how folks move through these types of things and, and structure communication. Um, 
There's an impact, um, of course, when we have, when we really rely on our student employees for operations, when we run student crews, there's an impact there that we're all um, working through. Um, and it's really important that we um, show our staff that we value them and that we understand in this time of transition um, that things feel differently regardless of where they're working, whether it's remote or on campus, and how do we show value to folks in each of those places. Um, and so um, those are just kind of some summary things on what folks have shared today um, that I wanted to highlight and um, appreciate those who have jumped on and shared. Please make sure you do look at the chat. There's lots of great things um, in the chat area, questions, suggestions on what folks are doing. So another great resource for you. Um, Want to go ahead and make sure we roll to the next slide. Um, which is uh, join us. So if you would like to join us for the Housing Facility Services Committee, um, your level of involvement is up to you. And so you can be highly involved and put a lot of time in, or if you just wanna join us from um, monthly for our meetings and these discussions, you can do that as well. But you can email Joel, his information is there on the screen. He'll also follow up to this meeting um, with his information. You can complete the committee interest form so we can plug you in with a specific group. Um, and our next meeting will be May 18th at 3 p.m. Um, Eastern. And so I believe now I'm going to turn it back over to Spencer. All right, Teresa, thank you. Teresa and Joel, thanks for getting this group together. Um, great discussion, great topics, obviously really salient topics as always. Um, so thank you all for diving into that. And, you know, showing us that we can hold a virtual roundtable with many faces and many microphones and still make it work. So thank you for all that we're able to input, share input through this. Um, a couple last notes as, yes, I can't wait to do this again on May 18th next month. Wahoo. Um, we have an Akuai resource page again. Check that out. Um, we are continuing to release straw polls. Uh, so take a look at that straw poll data that's on our resource page as you're trying to look at what's happening on your campus and comparing and contrasting that to other campuses and other approaches. Uh, we have two more virtual roundtables on the calendar for this week. We have a space for professionals of color uh, tomorrow and then on Wednesday, a pretty intense, large scale virtual round table, the future of housing, no pressure on us to put that one forward. So um, I really look forward to seeing many of you on our future, future virtual round tables. Thanks for your time and energy today. This will be recorded. Uh, so again, make sure that if you have a colleague that missed out, we'll be posting this recording and we'll be also sending it out to those who attended via email. Uh, Teresa, Joel, thank you for your leadership and stewardship of this group. I bid you adieu. Have a great rest of your day and a great rest of your week. Bye, everyone. Thanks, y'all. Thanks, everyone. Great job, everyone.